So hello and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. I'm your host, Leah Rosen, the online editor for Bioprocess International. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be made available for replay in the multimedia section of your website. We've muted the audio lines, but we welcome you to type in your questions for a speaker in the question answer window on your screen. After the presentation, we will begin the question answer portion and I will ask our speaker your questions. Your questions in the question and answer window will only be visible to myself and our speaker. So thank you for joining us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mark Fitchman. All right, uh, Leah, thank you for the introduction. And I also want to thank BioRat and BPI for organizing this webinar series and for inviting me to participate. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking about a uh, a portion of a downstream process uh, development activity for a retrovirus-like particle that is a uh, cancer therapeutic currently in the clinic. And I am I think if there's one take-home message uh, from this talk, it should be that process development is a scaled-down activity. At Somatech, we work with you know researchers, uh, CDMOs, uh, pilot facilities, manufacturers, facilities and one of the common problems we see is that is that there's often a, a scale up mentality people work out something at the bench and then they try to scale it up and that leads to a number of problems and I'll try to address uh, I'll try to keep visiting that as I go through this talk so in, um, with respect to anticipating where we're going to be in pilot or manufacturing? Again, we start with where we're going to land, and then how do we fill in the how do we fill in the spaces in between? And the process that we're anticipating for this uh, at this you know for this project uh, was we had a production cell line, so there was no transfection event. Uh, the cell line constitutively expressed uh, our our uh, drug substance, like I said, a virus like um, a, a retrovirus like particle. Um, we know there's going to be a thon expansion. We're going to expand into a 250 liter reactor for the pilot scale. There's going to be clarification that's going to comprise depth filters and a membrane filter, a chromatography unit operation, a concentration and formulation unit operation over, you know, basically TFF, and then final fill and finish. And for today's talk, I'm going to focus only on the purification process development that we were doing for this project. Like to talk a little bit about what our our product is. It's a uh, like I said, it's a retrovirus-like particle, and so here I've shown um, on the left a schematic of you know just a retrovirus schematic, a, 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 a membrane-bound uh, particle, proteins on the outside, proteins on the inside, a nuclear capsid, and the genetic payload, and then on the right is a micrograph of the uh, well same beast. And I think there's two take home, there's two points here. One is that the particle is large. It's over, it's over a tenth of a micron, which means um, it's just right on the edge of being able to sterile filter. Um, also, it's uh, decorated with uh, proteins, largely glycoproteins. Uh, the number of proteins, the exact uh, charge of each protein is variable. And so this is a common problem a common challenge to people doing process, you know, downstream process development for viruses is, is uh, they tend to be heterogeneous with respect to charge and other, and other characteristics. Perhaps AAV is an exception, but um, like I said, this is common, a common, a common challenge. Uh, another common challenge in doing process development, and I think anybody who's done any process development has had some consternation in this in this area, is uh, analytical support. Whether or not you're whether or not you're doing the analysis yourself, or there's a QC department doing this for you, um, uh, analytics are critical uh, in three main categories: uh, product concentration, you know, how much is in, how much of my product is in one of my samples. Potency, uh, this is a little more challenging often with viruses than it is with things like enzymes and antibodies. But we want to know um, if, our, if, our, if our product is as active um, as it was when we started as we go through each step of the downstream process. And then lastly, uh, purity and safety concerns. And I'll touch on each of these briefly. 
For this particular uh, process development, we relied heavily on a qPCR assay. Uh, uh, retroviruses are RNA viruses, so there's a reverse transcription followed by uh, just standard thermocycling uh, and quantitation. Um, little cartoon here shows a conventional uh, qPCR output, but we did a lot of this work um, using BioRed's digital uh, droplet PCR equipment. And the data was the same. So this is how we could tell how much of our product was present. We had a number of potency assays or activity assays. Uh, the uh, schematic I show here is one that we relied heavily upon where we basically had plates coated with a reporter cell. We'd apply dilutions of our samples. And 15 hours later, we'd look for expression of the, uh, trans, you know, the therapeutic transgene. And we'd basically count cells. And that was the way we measured our potency. Purity, safety, this common cast of characters, host cell protein, DNA, process additives, adventitious agents, microbes, et cetera. Um, anybody who's done this could probably triple the size of this list. Um, and again, this shouldn't be much of a surprise to anybody. So getting uh, to the actual work, um, I want to address uh, some design space constraints that we had going into this project. <laughs> One is that we needed to use uh, anionic exchange chromatography. The second one was we needed to use phosphate-containing buffers. Um, I can't discuss why we had the requirement for anionic exchange, but with respect to the phosphate-containing buffers, it had to do with product stability. Um, and again, phosphate buffers and anionic exchange columns tend not to play so nicely together, so we had to be mindful of that as we went through this. Uh, and then known challenges, um, we were routinely seeing a lot of nonspecific adsorption to different surfaces. We knew this before we started the uh, process. So mindful of that, um, that informed uh, some of our initial screening studies. Uh, here's one of the studies we performed. And this was, a this was a study basically designed to get a sense for process economics or which, which uh, chromatography resin might be best with respect to economics. And basically, we loaded uh, uh, 19 mils of our feed stream onto a one mil column of uh, different uh, matrices, a couple of uh, Cytiva anionic exchangers, Biores Nuvia Q, and uh, Sardabine Q from Sartorius. And all we're looking at this point is we put a, we put a certain amount of our product onto one of these uh, supports. We try to get the product off. How much do we get? And this doesn't tell us anything about whether or not the product is going to help us get a uh, this product is going to help us get a pure drug substance, but it does kind of stack rank these products in terms of you know, some economic considerations. It's expensive to make the feed stream. The more product we get off, uh, the less expensive the product is going to be. And clearly, the uh, Nuvia Q from Biorad looked uh, looked better than the other products we tested. And then we proceeded to work with that product. Um, first thing we did is try to get a sense for, with respect to buffer chemistries, what the neighborhood of chemistries was that would work, that we would then uh, drill into. Uh, so we did a series of gradients. This is one where we load material onto one of these one mil columns. We do a sodium chloride gradient in this example. And we look to see where the product's coming off, where the contaminants are coming off. Uh, if you look at the bottom of these, uh, the top chromatogram and the uh, lower uh, portion of the chromatogram, the insert, um, at the very bottom, there's a bar graph or histogram where we actually see how many gene copies of our product we're getting off. And we can see that uh, there's not a lot of correlation between uh, the UV species and, um, and, and the product, which is good because um, it means we're going to pretty easily move the product, contaminants away from the product. Um, of course, uh, a gradient isn't something you're going to want to transfer to a to a manufacturing uh, group. So we moved to doing step gradients. Our recovery has gone up from 20 something percent to 48. That's mostly because um, as you do step gradients, you tend to be more friendly to your assays. Products are more concentrated. At this point, we start looking at activity every time we look at quantity of our product. Um, at this point, we're having a hard time with chromatin contamination in our product. 
we introduced a uh, uh, endonuclease, a CMR Sessions endonuclease, to digest the uh, chromatin before going into the study. And we see that it's done no harm to our recovery, um, which is now up to 71%. Um, I think I skipped over, a, 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 I apologize, I skipped over um, a detail. While we we're doing this work, we continued to increase our load, uh, our volume load to column ratio. So by the time we're here, we're actually at 60 mils per uh, mil of resin, or 60 liters per liter if you're thinking about scaling up. Anyhow, the uh, point here is we've moved a lot of the UV absorbing species to the left on the chromatogram. And uh, this is what we want to do. Our product is still there and there's less contaminants present. This is the slide that shows there's, uh, our, our product is present and there's uh, the contaminants have moved over to the uh, left. And this is what we wanted to accomplish. If we take a look at the two slides side by side, or two chromatograms side by side, we can. it's pretty evident. Uh, the endonuclease digest basically uh, lowers the molecular weight of your chromatin and all of these UV absorbing species move to the left. Our product peak gets smaller, but our product is still present and therefore more pure. So uh, there were a number of other assays we were doing at the time. Um, it actually turned out our product was quite impure at this point. So it's now time to scale up. And um, as I mentioned uh, earlier during this, during the work on the one mil column, we had uh, scaled up the load from 19, uh, lead, 19 liters of feed stream to one liter of resin. Of course, we're at one mil scale at this point, up to 60. We didn't go past 60 because if we went past 60, we actually encounter a situation where we're gonna push the manufacturing crew uh, to something larger than an eight hour shift. And again, we're anticipating the end user of this process. So we're trying to be considerate of those folks. Uh, the resin, by the way, had not reached capacity. And the next thing we do is we uh, shift to what's, uh, what's basically a manufacturing scale column, 20 centimeter tall column. And all of our subsequent work is done on a 20 centimeter column. This is what we anticipate the pilot and manufacturing facilities are going to be using. And we just scale column diameter at the same time upstream folks are scaling up their process. So we're getting more and more feed stream to work with. And in the end, we've increased our column diameter 22X, and this has resulted uh, effectively in a 5,000 fold increase in column volume. Uh, if we take into account the threefold increase that we did in the small column, we've now uh, increased our scale of 14,000 fold. I've just talked about the things we're changing. I wanna emphasize the things we're not changing. Once we get to a manufacturing height, on the column, even though we're at that point just less than a centimeter wide, we lock into our column height and all scaling is then done at 20 centimeters. Um, we've maintained a, um, a linear flow rate of uh, 400 uh, centimeters per hour throughout the, in, for, throughout the duration. And lastly, um, even when we're at the one mil scale column, we were always uh, having a resonance time of three minutes. Um, or maybe more precisely, we were flowing at uh, 20 CVs per hour. Again, that's a pretty good, I didn't mention this before, that's a pretty good flow rate. Um, it's actually a very good flow rate in manufacturing. I've talked about the things. Um, ah, and so let's go ahead and take a look at, at, at how this all worked out. Um, the, uh, the chromatogram up at the top, uh, Red outline is what we're doing in the two centimeter tall column. All the rest of the chromatograms I show here are in the 20 centimeter columns of increasing diameter. Uh, I apologize. Um, the, 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 col the column diameter increases as I had shown on the previous slide. And uh, between the top and the bottom chromatogram, uh, this is the uh, 14,000 uh, X uh, increase that we've shown. And the main, the main point here is really that they all look the same, and this is this. This really is important. Um, you know, you know, if you if you do your scale down right, your scale up goes smoothly. Uh, quick look at uh, yeah, intermediate test results. Um, they were all quite good. Uh, we're at, at at this point. We're at three 
a little over three E9 virus particles per mil. Um, if you're working with an adenovirus or an AAV, that may seem like a pretty small number. Um, people working with Lenti and other retro uh, viruses, other envelope viruses in general, this isn't bad at all. It's actually pretty good. Our specific activity is 127% of reference. That's good. Um, endotoxins low, host cell proteins low, DNA is low, and we've got a number of other assays, um, you know, some process specific uh, assays we're running. Everything was in spec. And so I just want to summarize. Um, process development is a scaled down activity if it's going to go smoothly. Uh, analytics are critical. I don't think I talked much about uh, buffer chemistries, but once you've got a stationary phase, all the heavy lifting is done with the uh, design of the buffers. And then uh, lastly, critical parameters, uh, scaling is going to go smoothly, are things like maintaining column height, linear velocity, resonance time. And um, I think that's, that's all I've got. And thank you. I'm open for questions. Okay, great. Thanks. So the first question is, you described the development of a process for retrovirus-like particle. We are using an AAV vector. Would your process transfer to AAV? Um, yes and no. The exact process, and I think the audience may have noticed we didn't give exact buffer details. We couldn't. Um, but the exact process, no. Um, but the approach, uh, including the use of the resin and uh, the way we did the uh, the way we designed the studies, um, that applies to adenoviruses, retroviruses. It applies to proteins, um, and so the the approach is the approach is the one I'd use for an AAV or any other virus. The exact details are going to change as you do these processes, as you develop these processes. What is typical ion chromatography or HIC resin used to purify retrovirus-like particles? I'm sorry, one more time? It sounds like uh, I'm going to reword the question a little bit. <laughs> what is the typical ion, what is typical using ion chromatography or HIC resin to purify a retrovirus-like particle? Ah, yes. Um, most um, most, mo most virus-like particles, retro included, um, Probably the um, probably the probably the the resin that, the type of resin that does um, you know most of the heavy lifting is usually an anionic exchange column. Um, obviously, you know from this talk you can see uh, which one we liked for this project. You know the Biorad Nuvia Q we got really amazing uh, results at a very high flow rate. Uh, but in general, um, there's a lot of products on the market, and I would look at several of them. Okay. And you are adding nuclease to cell lysate. Do you need to test that you removed all nuclease and or nuclease activity from the purified product? Uh, yes, um, all is a little bit of an extreme term, but we generally show that uh, we remove it to the point where it's not detectable. Um, and usually whether or not your nuclease is benzenase or denerase, it's, it very rarely, uh, from my experience, co-lutes with, with your product. Um, in fact, I've never seen it collude with the product. Um, however, yes, we do test it, and um, it's one of our it's one of our release tests for all of the times we use it. Okay, um, so we have time for just one more question. Mark's talk was full of great details, um, and. I see a number of questions that have come in here. If we don't get to your question, we will be passing all these questions on to Mark. So go ahead and continue to type in your questions if you have more. We will get them passed to you uh, to Mark and he can follow up with you directly. So the last question for the webcast is, what is the pH that you're maintaining in anion exchange chromatography? Uh, in this particular case, we were operating at a pH of 7.5, I believe. In general, um, you know, with an ad with a uh, with a virus like this, you do need to you know avoid uh, strong acids. And in general, most people are using, and, and so are we. Uh, pH is between six and eight and a half. Okay, great.
Well, thank you, Mark, Mark, and thank you to our audience for joining us. The recorded version of this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website and as a registered attendee. You'll receive a follow-up email providing you with a direct link. We look forward to having you join us at future Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcasts. Look for those announcements in your inbox. Goodbye.